Hello and welcome to the Chauvin Arnoux webinar. Today, we're going to give you an introduction to earth resistance testing. Hello, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm Business Development and Marketing Manager here at Chauvin Arnoux, and I'll be your presenter this evening. If you'd like to connect with me after the webinar, please look me up on LinkedIn. So we always like to start these webinars with a little bit of history about the company Chauvin Arnoux. So we were founded in Paris in 1893 by Raphael Chauvin and René Arnoux. Chauvin Arnoux has played a major role in the history of test and measurement. We have a long and prestigious list of inventions such as the universal tester, the ancestor of the multimeter, and the current clamp. In the 20th century, more than 350 patents and brands were registered by Chauvin Arnoux. To give you an idea of the numbers, we have an annual turnover in the region of 100 million euros in sales revenue. We have 10 subsidiaries worldwide, of which the UK subsidiary is one. We have around 900 employees, seven production sites, six R&D departments worldwide, and we spend about 11% of our revenue in R&D. So welcome to the webinar. There's a few things we need to cover um, before we get started. So first one is testing, testing, one, two, three. So just make sure that you can actually hear us and uh, obviously see the content and everything that's going on. Usually if there is a problem, this is down to your local IT settings um, or maybe you haven't got your speakers plugged in correctly. And if you still can't connect, sometimes logging off the session and back on again will we'll correct that. So um, hopefully you can hear me and uh, yeah, everything's uh, going smoothly. So the duration of this webinar is approximately one hour plus the live Q&A. So at the end of the session, we have live Q&A where you can ask your questions and uh, we'll go through those uh, for you. So we do that at the end of the session. You can also use the chat box for your questions. So during the session, we're on hand to answer any questions that pop up during the session. So feel free just to type those into the, the chat box, the questions box, and we'll answer those as we go through the session. Also, remember to download the presentation handouts. If you have a look in the GoTo toolbar, you'll see a little section there called handouts. And in there, we've got a PDF copy of the presentation slides. So you can download those before you leave the session. You will also get a certificate sent out to you after the session, uh, just to record that you, you attended. And the video will also be available soon um, on our media uh, website, www.caUK.tv. And we have got all of our previous webinars on there as well. So always worth checking out that website and have a look at the content that's on there. So with that said, let's get started. So today we're going to take a look at an introduction to earth resistance testing. So within the webinar, we're going to cover an introduction to earthing systems and the requirement for earthing. Testing earthing systems by the measurement of earth fault loop impedance. Testing earth electrodes using the fall of potential method. And then we're going to finish up with selection of test equipment to carry out earth resistance testing. In this section, we're going to give you an introduction to earthing systems and the requirement for earthing. Earthing is a core principle of almost all electrical distribution networks around the world. This principle relies on the fact that the topsoil and subsoil, which make up the surface part of the Earth's crust, have the ability to conduct electricity. Obviously, this depends on factors like moisture content, and even in ideal conditions, soil will never conduct as well as a copper wire. But one thing that soil does have in its favour is the massive cross-sectional area making it a surprisingly good conductor. By connecting all parts of our network to Earth, we can use Earth as a large common reference point. We also connect the neutral points of the supply network to Earth, creating a path for Earth fault currents to flow. In the UK, there are three main ways that electrical installations are connected to Earth. These are known as earthing systems. Two are TN systems and rely on the supplier's Earth connection. 
In a TT systems, the consumer has their own connection to Earth. So there's just some terminology and some uh, some sort of terms that you need to be aware of. So if we have a look here on the, the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see we use these letter conventions. So you'll see the word T in TN and TT, for example. And T uses, you know, it, it's a Latin, Latin term for Earth, um, terra, basically. So T is terra. N, quite a simple one there, neutral. C is combined and S is separate. So the systems that we've we've actually got, and we'll look at the diagrams for these systems a bit more, is we have two TN systems as mentioned. So the TN, TNS, uh, in this system, Terra or Earth and Neutral are separate conductors. TNCS, so in TNCS systems, in this system, Terra, Earth and Neutral are combined into one conductor in the supply and then separated within the installation. So it's terra neutral combined and then separated, TNCS. And in a TT system, in this system we use one earth electrode at the supply transformer to make the connection to earth, terra, and a second earth electrode to connect the installation earthing system to earth, terra. So it's a terra, terra or TT system. So let's have a look at the, the sort of the starting point, really. It's, it's the, the sort of most straightforward and easy one is a TNS system. TNS systems are still quite sort of quite popular out there. There's still quite a few TNS systems around. Um, TNS systems are generally, you'll find these usually in, in built up areas, urban areas, um, areas where, you know, a lot of sort of installation was done in one go, like housing estates, blocks of flats, things like that. Um, so in a TNS system, how do we identify a TNS system? Well, if you have a look on the, uh, the left-hand side diagram there, normally you will see the main earthing terminal, the MET, connected to the supplier's earth, um, and the supplier's earth usually is the lead sheath of the supply cable. So you'll have a lead sheath supply cable, and then usually soldered to that will be the earthing conductor, and the earthing conductor will connect to the main earth terminal. So you can normally see that the actual sheath of the supply cable is used as the means of, of conducting into the installation. Now you may in certain cases see where this has fallen off um, and sometimes people even try and uh, sort of reinstate these with things like pipe bonding clamps, BS951 pipe bonding clamps, which is obviously quite dangerous because you're very likely to crush the cable uh, when you're putting that on and uh, yeah, that could, could be... Uh, could be very dangerous doing that. Um, you do occasionally see other types of uh, systems that aren't lead sheath that are TNS, um, you know, where they actually use sort of the armoring or an outer braiding or something like that. But generally, they tend to be uh, normally a sort of lead sheathed uh, cable, quite often wrapped in a sort of tar paper or something like that around the outside of it as a TNS system. Now, if we look on the right hand side here, the actual. Um, diagram what's going on diagra diagrammatically in here um so what you can see is within the consumer's installation we still have the three wires that we're used to really we'll have the the line conductor or line conductors if it's a three-phase system we have the neutral and we have the the protective conductor the earth in there um, as usual but outside the installation the supplier's installation we still have two separate conductors for the neutral and earth but what you can see there is they are actually joined together so within the within the the supply um we actually have an earthing point the neutral point is connected down to earth using an earth electrode so the actual earth fault path of a tns system um doesn't actually rely on the earth electrode so although the earth electrode is there for a reference point and it provides you know other other forms of protection so if we're standing on you know on the ground and we touch a live part it will give a fault path through us um, but really the actual normal earth fault loop is around the line the protective conductor through the supply transformer and and around there so that's your normal earth fault loop so again because we're relying on conductors it's quite a low resistance quite a reliable and low resistance earth path there 
Now, moving on to a TNCS system. These these systems could also be known as PME. You might you might um, hear a TNCS system referred to as a PME system, Protective Multiple Earth System. Now, the difference with this is a TNCS. So, if we first just have a look at the uh, the diagram on the right, actually. Um, if you have a look, we have this thing in the supply called a pen conductor, a protective earth neutral conductor, because it does the jobs of both protective earth and neutral in one conductor. So rather than having two separate conductors, two separate cables like we had in the TNS system, we actually combine these within the supply into one conductor. Within the installation, they are the same. So within the installation, are the same as any system. We have a line, a neutral, and a protective conductor. Um, so within the installation, they are separate, but in the supply, they're combined into this, this um, pen conductor. Now, the reason that this type of TNCS system is called a PME, Protective Multiple Earth System, is actually at various points along the pen conductor, they will actually connect that down to earth using uh, supplementary uh, earth electrodes. So that just increases the uh, the connection with Earth and also adds a bit of resilience to the system. So if we were to lose or get a break in the pen conductor, chances are we would still have a connection down to Earth and we wouldn't lose, you know, the whole installation uh, earthing due to a fault in the supply. So generally, protective multiple Earth systems, TNCS systems, um, use multiple Earth spikes within the pen conductor to ensure increased uh, connections with Earth. So identifying, if we look on the, the left-hand side here, identifying a TNCS system. Normally what you'll see is, obviously, the supply cables, um, supply cable comes in. Quite often this is a split concentric or concentric type cable. And what you will see is normally the earth um, conductor will come out of uh, the supplier's cutout. So just above where the main fuse is, you'll see generally there'll be a little terminal or, or a little cutout there. And rather than coming off the sheath of the cable, as we as we saw with the TNS system, we'll see this coming out. And what you'll find within that cutout, there is a little link there, uh, the TNCS or PME link that actually joins the neutral and the protective conductor together. And that's where the pen conductor splits into two. So that's where we get the 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 S, the separate. Uh, or the separation between the neutral and the, the conductor in there. But up until that point and going into um, the cutout, you would just have two conductors. You have the line conductor and the pen conductor um, going in there. <clears throat> You'll quite often also see stickers on these systems saying PME or maybe TNCS as well in there just to actually tell you what they are. But uh, very, very, very common system. This has sort of been adopted for years as the sort of standard system. Um, in many installations, just because it's you know it, it's very sort of efficient um, in its use of just two conductors, the line conductor and the pen conductor, and we don't need like lead sheath cables or any of those sort of things in there. So, so very very common TNCS uh, systems, um, and we're now going to have a look at TT systems. So TT systems, um, TT systems. This is really more what we're talking about today. Um, because obviously we're talking about earth electrode resistance testing um, and earth resistance testing. So really this is where TT systems are, you know, this, this is the sort of uh, test we'd need to do with, with TT systems. So the difference with the TT system is obviously it's a Terra Terra system. You don't have a metallic earth return path. Uh, the earth return path is through the general mass of earth. So um, in the other two systems, the TN systems, the consumer didn't have their own earth electrode. They relied on a metallic earth return path. Whereas in a TT system, as you'll see from the diagram on the left here, the way we identify a TT system is we have our own earth electrode and then our earth electrode is connected via the earthing conductor to the main earthing terminal. So TT systems are very, very common, um, certainly in rural areas, but they're actually becoming more common now as... as you know, the supply system ages. A lot of times now, you know, you've got TNS systems are being converted to TT because the earthing's failed. Um, and in a lot of cases, even the DNOs are actually sort of, you know, instructing people that they, they have to be responsible for their own earthing and they're not going to provide an earth to certain types of installation. So TT systems are sort of having a bit of a resurgence, really, um, from that side of things. So being able to know how to test them, which is what we're here to, to talk about today, 
is really, really important. So if we just look at the diagram on the on the right hand side here, you can see again within the within the consumer's installation, as with the other two systems, we still have the same three wires. We have our, our line, our neutral, and our protective conductor. But the difference is that we then connect down through our earth electrode, our consumer's earth electrode, through the general mass of earth and back up through the uh, supplier's earth electrode and into the system. So, as you would imagine with these things, you're not going to get the same sort of low levels of resistance in the earth fault loop that you would have seen with the metallic earth return systems, the TN systems. With those, we're talking very low, below an ohm, um, very low um, resistances in the earth fault loop, whereas in a TT system, we're talking you know a lot higher because we are including the, the general mass of earth within that circuit. So just a little bit about why we do earthing really and and there's many 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 reasons for earthing but but um again in the wiring regulations and in the majority of electrical installations in the UK uh we use this protect, protective measure um called ADS automatic disconnection of supply um older electricians amongst you may have heard the term EBADS um we used to under like the 16th edition and stuff like that we used to talk about EBADS Earth potential bonding automatic disconnection of supply. Whereas now in the modern wiring regulations, we talk about protective measure ADS. So the earthing of exposed conductive parts means that if there is a line to earth fault, current will flow and operate the protected device to automatically disconnect the supply ADS. So if we look at the diagram on the right here, you can see the earth fault loop path. This is, I've used a T and S system here, just by way of diagram, because it's easy, but it's very similar for the, the other types of, of system earthing. So you can see where the red arrows go round in a circle there, and that gives us the, uh, the earth fault loop path. So if we do have a fault between line and any exposed conductive parts, any earth metal parts, um, current then flows, and it can flow down the protective conductor back to the new, through the neutral point and around that loop. Now, because that that earth fault loop impedance, what we call ZS, the earth fault loop impedance, is very low, the fault current is very high. And if the fault current is very high, then the protected device operates, the fuse or the circuit breaker will operate under those conditions very quickly. So it is it's really important that we've got a good low resistance path there. Now I talked about the whole earth fault loop impedance there, and we talked about ZS, which is the system or total earth fault loop impedance. So that's the impedance of the whole lot. And that's made up of various bits. So ZE is the external earth fault loop impedance. And we'll be talking about measuring external earth fault loop impedance in the coming slides. So that's the impedance of everything outside of the installation, which in a TT system obviously includes um, the consumer's earth electrode as well in that measurement. Now, the other bits we've got in there is R1, which is the uh, resistance of the, the line conductor, and R2, which is the resistance of the circuit protective conductor, and any other earthing in there that goes back to the, the supplier's means of earthing. So within that circuit, obviously we've got the total earth fault loop impedance ZS equals ZE, the external bit, plus the resistance line conductor, plus the resistance of the protective conductor. And as we said, the lower the resistance of that, the higher the fault current will be in the event of an earth fault, and the quicker the protective device will operate. Obviously, if you're a bit into the wiring regulations and you get a bit more into it, you will see how we calculate the maximum values of ZS for certain circuits, because if, the, if ZS is, is too high, um, then the protected devices won't operate within the disconnection times required by the wiring regulation. So as electricians, when we're designing circuits and when we're doing inspection and testing, we do spend a lot of time making sure that both the ZE and the ZS are within the required parameters so that we actually do achieve ADS. We do achieve automatic disconnection of supply. Now, there's also many other reasons um, in addition to... Uh, protection by ADS, why we might have earthing or why we might have earth electrodes. So lightning protection systems, you know, very common on tall buildings and all sorts of buildings will have lightning protection. And obviously the point of the earth electrode there is to, again, conduct the electricity 
um, usually on the outside of the building or or through the lightning protection system of the building down to to earth in the safest way possible. So lightning protection systems generally have earth electrodes and obviously they need testing. Generator earthing. So if we're actually setting up our own generation, so usually this would be a you know a diesel generator or something like that, but it could be any generation system that we're we're actually uh, connecting up. We may want to actually earth that. Sometimes we use systems that aren't earth; they're electrically separated. Um, and there's there's you know sort of pros and cons of why you would do that. But in many cases, a lot of generators we do actually connect down to earth, so we do need to test that earth electrode. Creation of equipotential zones. Yeah, in certain places like substations or um certain special areas you may want to ensure that everything is all at the same potential so what you might do is actually around that facility you may put in multiple earth electrodes and join them all together to ensure that everything within that location is is actually within a sort of equipotential zone so quite specialist depends on certain sites where you want to ensure that there is no potential difference um, because obviously potential difference um, is voltage and that could potentially give you uh, electric shocks there could be electric shock risk there so in a lot of places sometimes they will actually put a, a sort of multiple earth spike network in there to create this equipotential zone um, within a certain site or location dissipation of static electricity so in many cases we might have a build-up of static um, this could be, you know, we could actually have a, uh, a factory making electronic components and we want to have, you know, anti-static matting and static dissipation, all those sort of things. It could be a factory where you've actually got, you know, powders maybe being manufactured and things like that, where they're very prone to building up static electricity and could even, you know, potentially explode. Um, so again, in those, those instances, we may have earth electrodes fitted um, to dissipate that down to earth. Improved radio transmission and reception. Yeah, many radio towers will be uh, um, connected to an earth electrode that actually basically extends the uh, the radio propagation. It, it gives you a lot better transmission and reception. So many masts and radio towers and things like that will also be connected down to ground. And also improving EMC, so electromagnetic compatibility or electromagnetic interference EMI protection. So if we've got a facility, maybe like a data center or something like that, that could be quite sensitive to electromagnetic interference, we may want to actually set up a, an earthing system within there, an equipotential zone or like a Faraday cage type arrangement to, uh, to stop or reduce the amount of electromagnetic interference within a certain location. There are loads of other reasons on here, and obviously I've just picked some of the, the most popular ones really in there being protection by ads you know so earthing for safety lightning protection generator earthing and things like that and then some of the other applications uh, may be a bit rarer but there's you know there's definitely loads of different applications out there so what types of earth electrode um, are we allowed to use because everybody always thinks of an earth spike but actually under bs 7671 the wiring regulations there are a lot of other um, types of electrode listed so earth rods or pipes, earth tapes or wires. So these are actually long metal tapes that we dig in a trench and bury in the ground or long wires that we actually again dig in a trench and bury in the ground. Earth plates, we can use a plate or a grid system that we can actually bury in the ground. Um, underground metal work. So if you've actually got say structural steel work within your building and that's embedded in the foundations, it is accepted under BS 7671 to use that as the earth electrode. Obviously, you do need to test that and make sure um, that you meet all the requirements of the regulations, but you can use that as your earth electrode. Uh, welded reinforcement of construction, uh, so of reinforced concrete um, used in the construction of buildings and things like that, you can actually use that, again, as long as you've complied with the requirements of the wiring regulations. Metal coverings of some cables. Yeah, some cables where they've got a metal covering on the outside, you are actually allowed to use that as an earth electrode. Again, there are some terms and conditions in the wiring regs, but it is covered within there. And other uh, suitable underground metal work that's obviously suitable for the job and again meets the requirements of the wiring regs. So it isn't just earth spikes. There are various options and potentially, you know, for certain applications, you may need to use 
multiple earth electrodes, different types of earth electrodes. Um, yeah, it's it depends on soil conditions. It depends on actually what you need to do to, to get those readings. But um, the main takeaway from this is it's not just an earth spike. There are many, many, many different means of earthing. And, and obviously um, we test them. Um, and that's important that we actually test them to make sure that they are there and working correctly. Now let's take a look at testing earthing systems by measurement of earth fault loop impedance. In TN systems, the external part of the earth fault loop, ZE, can be verified by using a simple two wire or three wire no trip earth fault loop impedance test on an MFT such as the CA6117. So we mentioned um, with TN systems um, that actually we've got a, a metallic earth return path. So we're expecting relatively low resistances. And uh, one of the most easy ways to do this is to use an earth fault loop impedance test, an external earth fault loop impedance test. So what we would do with this is, is in both, both cases, whether it's a, a TNS system or a TNCS system, um, to actually measure it properly, we need to disconnect the earthing conductor before carrying out the test uh, to make sure that we don't actually get any parallel paths. Now, if we are going to disconnect the earth conductor from the electrical installation, we do need to make sure that it's switched off and isolated before we do that. Obviously, we don't want to be removing the earth from a live installation. So we would switch off and lock off the installation. We disconnect the uh, earthing conductor and we would connect up as we said, either a two-wire uh, no-trip test, sorry, a two-wire two high-current test or a three-wire uh, no-trip test um, to the relevant terminals, um, usually the line and earth, but as we said, if it's a three-wire test, you'll connect the neutral up as well. And your tester will perform an earth fault loop impedance test. It's a relatively quick and easy test. Um, what it does is it places a a known resistance between line and earth and it measures the the volts drop and off that it can it can work out the uh, the resistance and from that give you a reading of um, the external earth loop impedance ze now because we are expecting quite low values in here in a tns system you can see there that we're expecting this is this is under bs 7671 we're expecting the external earth fault loop impedance to be less than or equal to 0.8 of an ohm. So it's a you know very low reading really there. Um, and even lower with the TNCS system, um, because of the pen conductor, um, we're actually expecting this to be under 0.35 of an ohm. So this is a really quick and easy way of measuring the external earth fault loop impedance, ZE. Um, we also do this uh, within the installation, you know, at the end of circuits and things like that, to um, to measure the the ZS, the actual total earth fault loop impedance or the system earth fault loop impedance. Um, but obviously, what we're talking about here is just measuring the external earth fault loop impedance. And obviously, one thing to remember is make sure that if you have connect, conducted a, a ZE test and you've disconnected the earthing conductor to carry out the test, the second you're finished, make sure you connect that earth back in. You don't want to be leaving the earth disconnected from the electrical installation when you re-energize it. So always make sure you connect your earthing conductor back in the second you finish the test. So with TN systems, very straightforward, very easy way to measure um, the external earth fault loop impedance and confirm the earthing for the installation by using a multifunction tester and performing uh, an external earth fault loop impedance test. Now, in a TT system, we can do basically exactly the same. So, in a TT system, the external uh, part of the earth fault loop, ZE, can be verified using a simple two-wire or three-wire no-trip earth fault loop impedance test on a multifunction tester such as the CA6117. The measurement includes the resistance of the consumer's earth electrode, so RA is taken to equal ZE for measurement purposes. So what, what are we said there? Well, what we're saying is because we're measuring on the earthing conductor, 
we're measuring the external earth fault loop impedance, which includes actually, it's not fully external because it includes the consumer's earth electrode. So we're measuring down the consumer's earth electrode through the general mass of earth, up the supplier's earth electrode, through the supply transform and back down the supplier's line conductor to the installation. So although the actual measurement we take is all of that, because we can't differentiate, we don't know which part of that was, was our electrode, we don't know which part of that was the, the supplier's electrode. If we assume for measurement purposes that RA, the earth spike resistance, is equal to the ZE, then we're going to be on the safe side. We know we're pretty much right with that. Generally, it will be slightly lower than ZE, obviously, because the resistance of the wires, the transformer, the supplier's earth electrode. But if we go with RA, is equal to ZE, then pretty much for measurement purposes, that, that's that's the value we take. Now, remember for the TN systems, we were talking TNS had to be less than 0.8 of an ohm, uh, less than or equal to 0.8 of an ohm. And in the TNCS system, it had to be less than or equal to 0.35. In a TT system, because the general mass of Earth is actually included in that, we usually use the standard figure and say that it needs to be less than or equal to 200 ohms. Now, that will depend on what type of protected device you've got in there. And in many cases, sometimes people say 100 ohms as a sort of standard figure to give themselves some, some wiggle room just in case there's, you know, changes in soil conditions, changes in temperature, freezing, drying out of the soil, all those sort of things. Sometimes people prefer to give themselves um, a bit of wiggle room by saying, say, 100 ohms. Um, realistically, it just depends on, you know, obviously the lower, the better with that side of things. But the sort of standard of 200 ohms seems to be uh, what's referred to in, in most of the IET guidance from that side of things. So as you can see there, if you have got an earth electrode, you have got a TT system, a very easy way and very quick way of measuring the external earth fault loop impedance. And by that, the earth spike resistance is by carrying out an earth fault loop impedance test using a multifunction tester. So, a lot of times where you've got an existing installation, that's what you're going to do. You know, it's a very simple, straightforward, and, you know, that is generally how most electricians would carry out a test on um, a consumer's earth electrode, which is part of a TT system. Now, there are limitations to the earth fault loop test method. So, we actually need a main supply present. So if we're actually going to carry out an earth fault loop impedance test, we can't do this before there's power to the installation. We can't actually carry this out on a, a new installation which hasn't been connected to the supply, for example. Um, so that does present us with a problem. It's not suitable for new installations, what we call initial verification. Now, I just want to, want to qualify this point a little bit just to explain that because a lot of times people will get confused with this. But if you actually have a TT system, and we're, I'm just talking here about TT systems, you have a TT system that's just been installed, and you don't know whether that earth spike is functioning or not. Now, it's potentially dangerous for you to energize that installation to carry out then, you know, an, um, an earth fault loop impedance test when you don't know that the earth spike is functional. So we will talk in a moment about actually carrying out a fall of potential test that doesn't require a supply and doesn't require um, the electrical installation to be energized to carry out the test. So it is argued, uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make the case that any time you're installing a new earth electrode from scratch and the property hasn't got earthing at that point, you haven't, you know, it's not been proved there. Uh, it's not like an existing one or anything like that. If you're actually the first time that you're going to install and use um, an earth electrode, that you should actually carry out the test on that by the fall of potential method to prove that earth electrode before you energize the installation and actually carry out an earth fault loop impedance test. So just be just be very careful with that one because um, a lot of times people do, they just, they just, you know, sort of put it in, take a risk, you know, yeah, it'll be fine, it'll be okay. But obviously if there was a problem with that earthing system, 
um, and you, you you know you haven't proved that it that it's there, um, you could potentially you know there could potentially be a fault or danger could arise from that. So we'd always recommend really if it's a new installation, you're installing a new earth electrode, or it's an earth electrode that's been used for the first time, or you've got no evidence to say that you know it's been tested before or anything like that, then generally we probably would recommend doing a fall of potential test as a safety check first. It's a bit like anything with electrical installation, you want to do your sort of dead testing. You do your dead testing before your live testing. You don't go straight to your live testing. So by doing something like a fall of potential test instead of a live test like earth fault loop impedance, it's generally a safer way to proceed. So ZE is not safe on live installations. So if we are going to do um, a measurement by earth fault loop impedance, and we're measuring external earth fault loop impedance. I said that what we need to do is we need to disconnect the earthing conductor when we carry out the ZE test. And the reason we do that is so that there isn't any parallel paths. So we're not actually reading back through our water bonding, for example, down our, our, or our gas bonding, uh, or maybe even structural steel work or something like that. So we would disconnect the means of earthing. Now, if we're going to disconnect the means of earthing from the installation, as I said before, it must be isolated and locked off. So if you've got a building, you know, where it's very busy, there's essential things going on in there, you can't turn the power off, it's it's very difficult to actually go down the route of, of doing this type of test in that scenario. Um, and what you might have to do is you might just have to do a ZS test or a ZSDB type test where you're not actually measuring the, the, the external earth fault loop impedance. You're measuring um, the, the total earth fault loop impedance or the earth fault loop impedance at the distribution board um, because you can't measure the external earth fault loop impedance because you can't separate it from the rest of the earthing system. So another downside is that it isn't an exact measurement of RA. Um, as we said, um, we're only measuring ZE, we're measuring the external earth fault loop impedance. So we don't know the resistance of that earth electrode itself. It might be very high, it might be very low, but you don't know that. You just know that the whole loop has a certain value. So you can imagine a situation where, for example, the supplier's earth electrode could be very low, your earth electrode could be very high, but within that, it all seems to read out okay but actually you know over time you could find there's corrosion going on or something like that and you're not actually understanding you know that there is deterioration or something like that so again you know by using another method you could actually determine the exact value of ra as opposed to uh, the loop value um, we can't measure individual electrodes. Again, if, if we've got a system where we've got multiple electrodes, and this does happen happen quite often where you've got systems with multiple earth electrodes or multiple um, you know, earthing points, so we could have structural steel work or anything like that, and they're all joined together into an earthing network. Again, you can't measure the individual electrodes. So you might have one electrode that's higher than all the others, but you wouldn't necessarily know that because you're measuring the whole lot. And we can use other selective methods to actually work those out we can actually do those measures measures as well and no good for lightning protection or other such applications so obviously we you know to do an earth fault loop impedance test we said we need a supply we need the earthing within the supply and all that sort of thing so for things like lightning protection where there isn't the supply it's not associated with a the supply then obviously we, we can't use earth fault loop impedance for for that method um, we have to go down a different measurement technique. Now let's look at testing of earth electrodes using the fall of potential method. When the earth fall loop impedance measurement is not appropriate, the resistance of the earth electrode can be measured directly by using a dedicated earth resistance tester along with temporary test electrodes and long test leads. There are many versions of earth resistance test, but in this webinar, we will concentrate on the basic fall of potential method. So what are we doing in a fall of potential test? Well, in a fall of potential test, um, we're actually carrying out um, a series of measurements and we start off with our electrode under test. So here you'll see 
we've got um, the electrode under test on the left hand side that's listed there as X. We then have a far electrode so we, we take a, a, te a temporary test electrode and we install that a long way away so it could be 30 meters away 50 meters away something like that from the uh, the electrode under test we connect that into the ground and what we do is we we actually inject a current a known current into that loop so what we're doing is we're creating a circuit between the electrode under test and down the test lead through the general mass of earth and we're creating this constant current so we've got part of the test that actually forms this constant current supply so we inject this current into the ground then what we do is we put in an auxiliary um, electrode in the middle so somewhere in between the two and we'll talk about exactly where in a bit um, but in between the two, we, we install in a straight line between the two, we install um, the auxiliary potential electrode. And what we do then is we measure the voltage difference between X and Y. So we measure the voltage between the original electrode under test and the potential electrode that we place somewhere in the middle. And what we can do from that is obviously a bit of Ohm's law because we know what the current is. We know the potential difference. So because we know the current and we know the potential, we can work out what the resistance is. So just a little bit of Ohm's law basically to work all that out. But that's effectively what we're doing. And, and any of the any of the tests that we look at today, what we call the fall of potential tests, are basically doing exactly what you see there. We're injecting a current into one electrode. We're using another electrode to measure the voltage. And then because we've got a known current and a measured voltage, we can work out resistance. Now, if we'd actually got uh, a system, um, we can actually sort of plot out the potential, uh, the, the potential difference across that system. So if we've got our grounding system, so on the left hand side there, we imagine that's our electrode under test. On the right hand side, we can see the current injecting electrode. So that's where actually injecting our current in and then what we could do is we could actually move our potential electrode at steps in between that so if we split them up into 10 and we move them 10 percent at a time we get resistance one resistance two resistance three four five and if we did that what we would get is this standard curve so this potential curve and this is where we talk about fall of potential method this is where the potential changes over that that curve and you can see on there what's going on so what we do is we could actually plot that and in some cases that's what people actually do they between the two they'll take measurements maybe 10 measurements maybe more measurements split it up even distances plot that and you can actually plot the curve and even with our in our data view software you've got the ability to to carry out uh those sort of measurements and actually plot that curve um now in most cases we don't we don't go that detailed we don't go in and plot the whole curve because really we, we want to know what the electrode resistance is now to actually work out what the electrode resistance is generally um, we'll take a measurement at a midpoint. Now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to hit the middle bit of this of this curve. Um, because as you can see on here, we've actually got near to each of those two electrodes, we've actually got a potential effect, we've got a potential gradient. And what we don't want to be doing is carrying out the measurements on that potential gradient because we'll get false readings. We want to fall in that step, that flat bit in the middle of the curve. Now, mathematically, if, we, if it's worked out scientifically, the middle of that is actually what we call a 62% point. Now, it seems weird to say the middle is at 62%, but that is actually sort of where the curve the, that is is the midpoint the midpoint of the curve 62 percent point um so that's 62 percent of the distance between the two is generally where the the middle of that that curve falls so 62 percent of the distance that's that's the sweet spot 
and that's where we aim to put our measurement electrode at that 62% point. Now, if you have a look at guidance note three, what you'll actually see, and you'll see this in a lot of guidance as well, they don't use the 62% point. They don't use the, the scientifically perfect 62% point. Um, they tend to use this sort of rule of thumb point. And, and what they say is that they, they put it halfway between the two. So halfway between the two, 50%. Um, now, after that, they pretty much agree that we move 10% either way. And we, we look at the readings and we average those out from there. Um, so just be aware there is a bit of ambiguity there that you'll, you know, we'll talk about the 62% point and Chauvin, our new products are designed based on this, this mathematically perfect 62% point. Um, and arguably, you know, that, that is the way we believe it should be done because that's, you know, scientifically that's, that's the correct way to do it. However, the 50% point, as you can see by looking at this curve, really, you are still on that flat bit of the curve. So you know, doing it at the 50% really is, is that going to make that much difference really to the measurement? Um, so generally it's more rule of thumb thing. Just put it halfway, 50%, that's it. So you will see that mentioned, but in our presentations and all the stuff we do in here, and I say the way our testers are, are, are designed, they're designed around this 62% point. So just be aware of that. So when we're doing this measurement, We've got the fall of potential. We've got this potential graph. We're looking to find the middle of that, and that's where we're going to put our earth electrode to carry out our tests. So we're going to go for the 62% point, so 62% of the distance between the two. So this is just a very, very quick diagram, and apologies, it is an American diagram, so it is in, in feet from that side of things, but this is just showing you roughly what we're doing with the tester. So generally, one of the electrodes on the tester, we're going to connect up to the, the, uh, the earth rod, the earth rod under test, which is the one on the left-hand side. We're going to put a suitably long distance away. As you can see here, they're saying 80 to 100 feet, um, you know, a, a reasonably long distance away. So we're outside of these what we call zones of influence. We're going to put the injection electrode, the electrode where we're going to be inserting that known current into. And then at 62% that distance, we're going to put the potential electrode in and we're going to actually allow that to measure measure that voltage. So a typical fall of potential test, this is, this is pretty much what it looks like. Now, it can get a little bit com complicated because many different manufacturers, different books, things like that, use different terms for their their testers they use different terms for the terminals so as you've seen the current terminals inject current between the eut the electrode under the test and the far electrode the voltage terminals measure the voltage difference between the uh, equipment on sorry the uh, electrode under the test and the near or the middle uh, test electrode now if you look at the naming on here for the current terminals um, on our testers, we, we have sort of a mixture a mixture of both really on there. Um, but you'll see those down as H and E. So H and E for the current terminals. And sometimes you'll see those as Z and X. Sometimes you'll see it as C1 and C2. Current 1, current 2. So just be aware, you may see different terminology, but they're, they're all doing the same thing. But sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. Same for the potential terminals. In the potential terminals, the middle two terminals on the, the tester there, um, it's S and ES. But sometimes you'll see those as Y and XV. And sometimes, more logically, you'll see them as P1 and P2, potential 1 and potential 2. Makes common sense. So just be aware, I've put that in there by way of reference. So if you are going through or you are looking at different types of tester and you do get a little bit confused with that, sometimes you can just see what's going on. So here we've got the electrode under test E and the uh, the current electrode um, H. So electrodes E and H have so-called zones of influence around them. These zones must be avoided when inserting the test electrode S. It is therefore recommended that H is positioned as far away as practical from E. 
So as we said, we want to get this as far away to give us that, that zone in the middle where we can actually measure. Um, and often, um, a sort of rule of thumb that's used for this is they say 10 times the length of the electrode under test E. So for example, if you've got a 3 meter earth electrode, 10 times 3 would be 30 meters away. If you've got a 5 meter earth electrode, obviously that would be 50 meters away. So you can see we are dealing with quite long distances in many cases here. But that just gives you a starting point, really, for the zones of influence. The zones of influence are affected by many things, you know, the moisture content in the in the soil, the type of soil, all sorts of things. So it's not exactly possible to say, you know, where they are. That's why they look a bit wobbly on the diagrams there, because it's it, they are a sort of, you know, an unknown factor. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get in that flat spot of the curve. We're trying to get into that that gap between the two. So it's why we do need to get a good distance between E and H. So we can get S in that 62% point in the middle without being in the zones of influence. So this diagram pretty much sums up what we are trying to do. So to perform a fall of potential test, we connect the tester as shown here. So you can see we've got the tester there, we've connected one terminal down to the electrode under test, which has been disconnected from the installation. And obviously the installation would be isolated before we did that as well. We then have the connection H with the temporary current electrode put in at the furthest point. We have the zones of influence. You can see the curve laid out on there. At the 62% distance point, we have put S the test spike in place. And then what we do is we take a reading at the 62% point. We then move 10% in either direction. So we move to 52% and 72%. So we move and we take those three readings. So 62, 52, 72, those are the readings that we take. If the readings obtain, obtained are similar, so we're within a few percent either way of those, then the reading can be taken as RA. So we can accept that reading then as the earth electrode resistance. However, if there is a variation, so there's quite a big variation in those readings, what we need to do is we're probably in the zones of influence. So we need to move H further away, move the current spike further away, go back to the new 62% point, and obviously repeat those tests. So we're just verifying by doing those three measurements that we are actually in that safe zone, that we aren't in those spheres of influence, and we are actually getting a reliable reading, and it's not being affected by the potential gradients of either the current spike or the, the spike on the test. So that, in its very essence, is how to do a fall of potential test. Now we have um, some of our products. We've got this is quite a new new product in the range. Actually, is sort of uh, a very simple um, earth resistance tester, which is our, our sixty two uh, forty two, and it's got a great feature on here. What you can actually see if you look at look on here, you can actually input the values for fifty two percent, sixty two percent, and seventy two percent. So when you're doing the test, you press the button and it'll put that store that value in as either the 52%, 62%, 72% value. Once you've got all three of those values in, it will work out the average for you. So no need for a calculator, it works out the average, and it will also give you the percentage deviation as well. So by putting those values in, you automatically get exactly what you want on the screen. So I think that's, that's why I wanted to highlight that. I think that's a really great feature, particularly for anybody who's just doing fall of potential tests, and, you know, no hassle, it's all there, straightforward, you know, if, you, if you're learning, if you're a beginner or whatever, you know, it's, it's just so simple and it's there. So again, you know, the products are built around the fall of potential test. So I think that's a, a great little feature. So now to finish up the webinar, we're going to have a look at the selection of test equipment to carry out earth resistance testing. So this is just a quick overview, really, of the products that Chauvin Arnu have got available um, for carrying out earth resistance testing, and just to give you a bit of a, 
bit of a quick overview. Obviously, there are, you know, a lot more details available on our website. And, you know, we'd be more than happy to, to carry out demos or show you these online or, you know, whatever you want to do with this. But it's just a quick overview, really. So we'll start off with what we call our simple earth resistance testers. So this is the, uh, the 6422 and the 6424. And these are recent arrivals to the CA range and offer everything you need to perform a fall of potential test. So these tests are lightweight, compact, and IP65 rated for use outdoors. So that's basically, for those of you not aware, it's pretty much waterproof. Um, so yeah, so they're, they're really well rated for use out in the field. Um, and also on the, uh, the 6424, um, that's got the additional feature of being able to put in, as I showed you before, the the uh, the fifty two percent sixty two percent seventy two percent values and automatically work out the averaging and everything for you. So yeah, for 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 basic and simple testers, the these absolutely you know hit the hit the nail on the head really. Um, they've got a great little sort of neck straps and all that sort of thing. So they they are really sort of portable, um, great little testers just for anybody who's who's starting off to get into this or just does you know a little bit of fall of potential testing, maybe your electrical contractor. You haven't got this function on your multifunction tester so you think yep yeah, actually there are occasions where i'm going to be installing earth spikes i need to do a fall of potential test these are great for that just add that into your toolkit now moving on up we have what we call our three in one earth resistance testers so this is the ca6460 and the 6462 and they're called three in one testers because they'll perform the fall of potential testing and this is either the three wire or the four wire version of that. Now, what we mean by the three wire version or the four wire version, generally, as you'll see on the diagram here, um, in many cases, uh, when we're carrying out the testing, we'll just use three terminals. And what you get is, is terminals E and ES are generally joined together. Um, so you'll see on the diagram here, on, on the image here, you can see there's a little link, a little metal link between E and ES, um, because those terminals go onto the electrode under test, and both of them go there. But what you can do, if you're using very long test leads, um, you can actually run separate leads for that, and, and it actually acts like a, a sort of potential bridge, um, so it, it cancels out or it neutralizes the effects of the test lead resistance within the measurement so if you are using very long um, distances you can use a four-wire measurement um, but if you're just using you know slightly shorter distances obviously you can get away with a three-wire measurement but these testers have the ability by adding and removing that link to do both both tests so we can do fall of potential either three wire or four wire it also does soil resistivity now soil resistivity is something we're going to touch on in the next um webinar in the series that we're going to do next month um, and soil resistivity really comes down to measuring the resistance of the soil so you can choose where to install your earth electrodes for maximum effect so we can actually actually map out soil resistance work out where the sweet spot is for installing our earth electrode and that could save us a lot in the cost of the earth electrode the cost of the earthing system so again, being able to measure soil resistivity is quite a useful function if you are going to be installing earth electrodes from scratch. Um, the third feature that we've actually got in here is a coupling measurement. And what coupling is, is we can actually connect to two different earth systems. So potentially, if we've got medium voltage, so we've got, you know, for example, 11 kV system, and we've got low voltage in our installation, um, we might, you know, get ill effect if the two were close together we could get interference and, and things like that between the two earthing systems um, so what you can do with this tester is you can actually connect up between the two and it will actually give you a coupling measurement and actually tell you how closely coupled those two earthing systems are together so again something that not everybody's going to use but it is a feature that's present in these in these three and one testers so these tests have also got a rugged uh, weatherproof case with carry handle. So you can see there we've got a sort of Pelly style uh, rugged case. So they're really designed for, you know, for use uh, in, the, in the environment and, you know, really sort of rugged, reliable testers. Um, and in the uh, CA6462, we've actually got rechargeable batteries. So the difference between the, the two, the, the 6460 and the 6462, 
is the 6462 has rechargeable batteries so you can charge it up whereas with the 6460 you have to put batteries you know normal batteries in the tester uh, but even though it's it's a battery powered tester it still do up to six hours worth of testing which is approximately nearly 1200 tests so if you think actually when you're doing the test most of your time is putting spikes in and laying out the cables and all that sort of thing it's not actually doing the tests um so you've got a really long battery life there on the uh, on the rechargeable model of that now moving on up the scale of it we've got what we call our advanced earth resistance testers um and i'm probably not doing them you know massive justice in this slide because again with the next webinar we're going to look into a lot more detail into the advanced uh, features that these products have um but what we've got in with these testers is we've actually got the ability to um download and store results so we can actually store the results on the tester we can download that into our data view software and that enables us to do reports and things like that within the data view software so these are storable downloadable type testers and actually with the the 6471 and the 6472 when they're paired with the optional uh, current clamps we can actually perform selective measurements so a selective measurement allows us to put the clamp around a particular earth spike and measure the resistance of just that spike within a multiple spike system or we can actually use two current clamps and actually carry out completely stakeless testing so that's the testing of an earthing system without having to put an earth spike in the ground which again is a very very useful function and something we'll look into more in next webinar there are also additional features, um, particularly with the 6472, where we've got an actual high frequency uh, measurements as well. So we can actually measure at much higher frequencies. Um, and again, that's something we'll touch on more in the, the next webinar as we get to it. Now, I mentioned briefly there that we've got our data view software. So our advanced earth resistance testers, uh, you can actually store results and download them into the data view software. In data view you can use standard report templates or create your own customized report complete with your own branding and company details so data view is a really powerful reporting and analysis uh, software there's loads of things you can do i don't know if you can actually make out in the bottom corner there but you can actually see you can plot out your actual fall of potential curve you can actually plot that curve out within the software and, and all sorts of really powerful uh, features in there for doing earth surveys and all sorts of things. So, you know, this is, this is where when you're getting more into this and you start getting more interested in it, this is where you start to see the advantages of having these advanced testers and really being able to get that data, analyze it and present it to your, your you know, your customers um, in that way. So great extra features there. Um, now, when you're dealing with earth testers, there is a wide range of earth testing kits and accessories available. Um, so again, it depends on you know how long a lead you need, and there's a huge array of different um, accessories and, and leads that we've got available. Um, so again, please just have a look at the website if you're interested in that and dig into it because there's there is a lot of uh, earth accessory kits. Also, something we're going to touch on in the next webinar. Um, is the uh, 6474 pylon earth testing kit so this is some really clever technology where we can we can pair the uh, the 6472 with this pylon testing adapter uh, kit uh, which is the the 6474 and what we can do is we can actually use um, Rogowski coils so the sort of coils that you might be used to for, for measuring current uh, in electrical installations we can actually put these flexible coils around the legs of uh, a pylon we can put a couple of uh, temporary earth spikes in and straight away within a few minutes we can actually carry out uh, an earth test on the pylon earthing system and actually see exactly what's going on with that um, so it's really exciting feature and something that you know it, it's so much quicker than carrying out a fall or potential test on a pylon um, so for anybody in that industry it's definitely something that's worth looking at and i know some of the dnos are starting to to pick up on this now and, and starting to specify this as sort of the way to go so uh yeah it's uh it's something we're going to talk about more extensively in the the next webinar but again it's a, a very useful accessory that we've got available for our 
um, earth resistance testers. So that brings the webinar to an end. Let's just uh, have a look at a summary. So we're going to give you an introduction to earth resistance testing. To do that, we, we took you through a bit of an introduction to earthing systems uh, and the requirements for earthing. So we had a look at the various earthing systems, TNS, TNCS, and TT systems. We talked about what they meant. We talked about ADS and all of those sort of things. We then went on to look at how we actually carry out uh, the test by earth fault loop impedance measurement so we can measure external earth fault loop impedance to confirm the earthing for an installation and for that we use something like a multifunction tester to carry out those tests it is quick it is easy and it's probably the preferred method in many cases but we discussed the drawbacks um, when we can't actually carry out that and when it may be more appropriate to carry out something like a fall of potential test we then went on to look at actually the testing of earth electrodes using the fall of potential method and we discussed this 62% point and the fact that we, we put out the two test electrodes. We have the electrode under test. We put the electrode in the middle and then we move it 10% either way. We look for a, uh, a sort of level reading, not much variation in there to give us our, our nice reliable reading. So we went through and talked about all the various methods of doing that. And then to finish up, we had a look at what test equipment is available to help you actually carry out this testing. Um, so hopefully that was really interesting and you got something out of this session. As I say, we're going to look at this again in, in the next session, really. We're going to have a bit more of a deep dive into more advanced techniques. But this was meant as a bit of a, a starting point and a bit of an introduction for you. So we've actually got coming up new resistance testing techniques that we talked about. And you can see there a little bit what I mentioned about uh, being able to test um the uh, the earthing of of pylons but we're going to cover a lot of sort of other techniques in there um soil resistivity will cover stakeless earth testing and all sorts of things so uh if you haven't done so already please have a look at that that's going to be going on on the 24th and 25th of february so about a month's time um so have a look at that one um you can go to our website uh caUK.tv um and have a look at the webinar section there and you'll see um that's uh, links there to sign up to that um and then following on from that at the end of march we're going to be doing another webinar but in this case we're going to actually have a look at low resistance measurements so we're going to have a look at our micro ohm meter products and what we can use to carry out low resistance measurement and again that pops up at the end of march these are all live on the webinar on the webinar section of the website so you can go and book these so it's not too late go and book your session now So thank you for attending and what we want to do now is just go through a few little things just before you, you leave the session. So the first thing we want to mention is just remember the down, to download the, the presentation handouts. As I mentioned on the go to toolbar you should be able to find the handout section and there is a PDF copy of these uh, slides available there. So feel free to go and uh, download those before you leave. You will be sent a, a certificate to say that you attended the session so that should come out to you uh, automatically i think it's usually about a week after the session um we have got other webinars available in our on-demand section of our website and if you are after more information obviously go to www.cauk.tv that's our website and you can have a look in there for more information on these webinars so now we're going to hand over to the uh, the live q a session so hopefully you've been typing in your questions into the questions box and if you haven't, obviously it's not too late to do that. So type all your questions into the questions box and uh, we'll join you for the live Q&A now.